Hello and welcome to Dove Biology, Apes Lessons to Go, and this video will be exploring the pollution of surface water. Water pollution is defined as any chemical, biological, or physical change in water quality that has a harmful effect on living organisms or makes water unsuitable for desired uses. The water that runs off the surface of the earth will actually pick up soil and water pollution and deposit that pollution in streams and rivers as it drains the watershed. It's the network of streams and rivers that drain our watershed and carry that water pollution ultimately into larger bodies of water such as lakes and oceans. Water pollution, like most pollutants, can be classified as two major types, point source or non-point source. Point source pollutants have uh, come from specific locations, like a drain pipe, a ditch, or a sewer line. You can point to it. You can identify that single source. Non-point sources can't be traced to a single site of discharge. It's coming from a multiple uh, set of areas that is then discharging that pollution into our body of water. Our number one non-point source water pollutant is agriculture. Uh, that's going to be the excess fertilizers and animal waste that will come off uh, when it rains. Our number two uh, non-point source pollutant uh, producer is going to be in industry. And then third is going to be residential runoff. You wouldn't think there'd be a whole lot of things that can come off of residences, but imagine all the things that could run off uh, from your even your neighborhood. Uh, the oil and antifreeze that might come from your parking pad, uh, animal waste like your dogs and that are out uh, when they use the bathroom, when it rains, the animal waste is going to make its way into waterways. And then a lot of folks do fertilize their lawns, and so that excess fertilizer from their lawns is going to enter into our bodies of water. Now, water pollution can have a lot of various effects depending upon the source of pollutant. There are many water pollutants that cause disease. Uh, these are oftentimes biological pollutants. Uh, fecal coliform bacteria, E. coli, and cholera are all uh, biological agents that can get into the water and cause severe disease. In fact, every 21 seconds a child dies of uh, diarrhea as a result of a uh, water-based uh, illness. Um, there can uh, pollutants can deplete how much oxygen is available into the water um, by its decomposition. For example, animal waste is yummy for bacteria. They're going to just go at it and start to eat it up, um, which is good because it's going to help to cleanse the water of that pollutant. But as the result, though, unfortunately, that bacteria is going to suck up all of that oxygen that is necessary for other things to live. Uh, plant nutrients. Um, coming from fertilizer, excess phosphates and nitrates can actually cause excessive algal growth. Uh, plants on land and plants in water have similar needs, um, and everything is in balance based upon those biogeochemical cycles. But when excess plant nutrients come off of agriculture or residential areas, that's going to cause excess algal growth, and so we'll call it an algal bloom. Chemical pollutants uh, can add toxins to aquatic ecosystems. Uh, thermal pollution uh, that might come from uh, coolant towers uh, for uh, both coal and um, nuclear power plants. When it releases that hot water into an environment, it's going to disrupt the, the temperature of that ecosystem and uh, can uh, damage life that's there. And then sediment, uh, erosion, excess sediment that comes off as a result of fast-moving water from the surface can then get into the water. Um, and then that sediment is going to block the ability of the sun to get through the water, and so it's going to decrease photosynthesis. There are many different ways to detect water pollution. One thing we might look at is how much dissolved oxygen is present in our water sample. Dissolved oxygen is an important abiotic limiting factor for aquatic ecosystems. Dissolved oxygen is how much oxygen is available and dissolved in that body of water for use by uh, consuming organisms. This uh, dissolved oxygen is kept in balance by the interplay between photosynthesizing water plants, algae, and bacteria, and um, our consumers, our heterotrophs, like a fish. The photosynthesizers produce um, the oxygen that our uh, organisms that complete cellular respiration are then going to consume. There are many things that could disrupt the amount of dissolved oxygen that's present, and one such thing could be thermal pollution. 
Temperature is really important for a liquid's ability to dissolve gases. Uh, colder liquids are able to dissolve gases a lot easier than warmer gases, and that's why when we open up a soda, we put it in the refrigerator to maintain it fizz, because that carbon dioxide is going to stay dissolved better in that colder liquid. If our temperature of our body of water or our soda increases, it's going to release that gas, and so it's not going to hold on to that um, oxygen as well. And so warmer temperature, something that releases thermal pollution, is going to alter the amount of dissolved oxygen that's present. Another thing that can change the amount of dissolved oxygen is when you have oxygen demanding waste that's introduced into a body of water. It's oxygen demanding because it's something that can be decomposed by the bacteria that lives in that body of water. And it's this decomposition of these pollutants that can actually increase the amount of oxygen that is needed by those bacteria. How much oxygen demanding waste that's present can be determined by measuring the biological oxygen demand of that system which basically means how much oxygen is being consumed by the heterotrophs and then of course the decomposers that are there that are trying to break down that oxygen demanding waste. So let's imagine that this uh, purple uh, uh, splat is oxygen demanding waste and you'll pay attention to the amount of oxygen that's present. As the bacteria go to town and start to decompose that waste, they're consuming oxygen so that they're able to carry out that aerobic decomposition. With each uh, level of decomp, the amount of waste decreases, but also the amount of oxygen available is going to decrease. This is causing what we call an oxygen sag. And if too much oxygen is removed from a system, then it's not going to be able to support other living organisms. And so things like fish will die because of the lack of oxygen that's present. Some other ways that we can uh, determine if there's a uh, pollutant in high quantities, one way is we could use a chemical detection kit. Uh, the presence of many inorganic and organic chemicals, things like nitrogen and phosphorus, can be detected with chemical test kits. You can also use uh, living organisms as indicators. Remember, all living things have a, a range of tolerance, and there are certain organisms that are very sensitive to changes in the environment. We call these sensitive organisms indicator species. So by looking at uh, how many individual organisms are present in a body of water and knowing their range of tolerance, we can determine uh, how much pollution might be present in that environment. Streams and lakes respond differently uh, to the presence of uh, degradable water pollutants. As long as a stream isn't overloaded and they have a good flow, they're actually going to be able to uh, remediate that degradable pollutant without causing a major harm to the overall stream system. Uh, this is why uh, in the early days of uh, waste removal, um, a lot of uh, communities actually just discharge their waste into uh, streams and rivers. Unfortunately, as populations increased, um, the streams were unable to uh, keep up with the ever-increasing amount of oxygen-demanding waste. If a small amount of waste is introduced into a, um, into a stream, a flowing stream, the initial area is going to be called a decomposition zone. Uh, this is where we're going to begin to see bacteria are going to increase in number and start to decompose that um, oxygen-demanding waste. Now, as we uh, move a little bit further down, the amount of oxygen that's available uh, in the next little region of that stream is going to be greatly reduced because of the increased decomposition. For this re reason, we're going to call that the septic zone. It's the septic zone because here there's so little oxygen, the fish aren't even able to be present. Um, this is kind of like the infected area. All we have are like uh, sludge worms and mosquito larvae and things, things that only require a certain amount of oxygen. Now, a little bit further down uh, from where the waste was introduced, we have a recovery zone. Um, the amount of oxygen is increasing because the amount of waste that's present is very low. So there's a little bit, very little um, oxygen uh, consumption. So the fish are able to come back. And then way down the river, we have our clean zone um, because the waste has already been completely decomposed. And so it's almost as though it wasn't even present in the first place. Now, lakes, on the other hand, because they do not flow, um, it's, you know, it's going to respond to the presence of that oxygen-demanding waste in a very different way. 
Because it doesn't mix and it doesn't flow, the amount of oxygen that's available is going to be used up very quickly. And uh, it's going to be very difficult for that lake to recover. Um, it becomes basically a dead zone, a dead lake. When excess plant nutrients like nitrates and phosphates are introduced into bodies of water, it can cause something called cultural eutrophication. When the plant nutrients enter into our body of water, it throws off our natural balance. The algae really appreciate the, the nitrates and phosphates, and so they'll have an explosive growth, which we call a bloom. Too much algae at the surface actually begins to block out the sunlight, which prevents photosynthesis by our uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, and they're going to die. So we already see a reduction in the amount of oxygen that's available in those areas. Now later, when all of these algae begin to die, they're going to be decomposed by the bacteria. The bacteria are then going to suck up a lot of oxygen from the water in order to do that decomposition, and that's going to cause an oxygen sag. Um, in our Gulf of Mexico, remember when we looked at uh, the Mississippi River and the fact that it drains 40% of our contiguous United States? Well, all of the, the plant nutrients that are coming from fertilizers, from uh, our residences and our agriculture is going to find its way into that Gulf of Mexico. The harmful causing these massive algal blooms, which we call HABs or harmful algal blooms. So then here we have massive dead zones, these oxygen depleted water that forms in the Gulf of Mexico uh, for up to half of a year as a result of these major algal blooms. And so if we can find ways to reduce the amount of nitrates and phosphates, we're going to be able to help protect um, our uh, coastal waters as well as local lakes and rivers. Despite its great volume, the ocean is also at risk for pollution. Now, as long as they're not overloaded, it, the oceans could dis disperse and break down a lot of degradable pollutants. But a lot of folks do see the ocean as kind of like our dumping ground. And so uh, it's seeing some serious uh, pollution problems. Now, most of the pollution is going to happen near the coast because that's where most of our population and development is. In fact, about 40% of the world's population lives near or on the coast. Unfortunately, as a result, the EPA has classified four out of five estuaries as threatened or impaired. Now, the big things that are impacting our oceans are sewage dumping, agriculture runoff, garbage dumping, toxic waste, and then, of course, oil. Now, oil spills have devastating effects. But what's interesting is that most of the oil pollution actually comes from activities on land. Studies have shown that it takes about three years for many forms of marine life to recover from large amounts of crude oil that directly come from the ground. Recovery from refined oil can take between 10 to 20 years to recover. So the water, the, the oil and the gas that's running off and coming from land use actually is having a bigger impact on the health of our um, oceans. Now, most developed countries have sharply reduced the amount of point source pollution um, and toxic chemicals that go into the water because of laws. But non-point solution, non-point source pollution is still a major problem in developed countries like our own. But pollution from untreated sewage and industrial waste is a major problem in developing countries because they don't have the laws or the um, environmental uh, protection agencies that we do. So really, the key to protecting our surface water, just like groundwater, is to prevent it from reaching those bodies of water. One thing we should do is make sure that all point source waste should be treated so that the water that leaves um, from a sewage plant is actually cleaner than um, the water that we are releasing that's, that cleaned water into. All agricultural runoff and sediment need to be reduced by using riparian buffers, move our feedlots where we're feeding our animals away from steeply sloped land um, and surface water so that the animal waste doesn't find its way into those bodies of water. We should use best practices when applying fertilizers and pesticides to minimize the amount that actually runs off. And 
all the, of our urban runoff can be reduced by reducing how much pavement we use, how many impervious surfaces we have, uh, and using things like rain gardens and green roofs. In the United States, um, we have a big law that really has helped us to maintain cleaner water. And this is the United States Clean Water Act. This allows for uh, funds to help uh, build wastewater treatment facilities and sets strict standards that uh, allows for how much water pollution that can be in certain areas. And if you're a water polluter, you actually have to get permits to say how much waste you're going to discharge and uh, how is that going to impact um, the surrounding areas. Clean water is a resource that we oftentimes take for granted. Right now, around the Olympic Peninsula in Rio, the amount of fecal coliform bacteria is 20 times the safe levels that we would have here in the United States. It's incumbent on us for future generations to ensure that our water is maintained high levels of cleanliness, um, not only here in the United States, but around the world.